Hello and welcome to Mystery Science. We're finally at the end of CP2, the forces topic in the Edexcel spec. Uh, again, this will also be useful for SP2, but also for anyone doing GCSE physics. Now, uh, we've been on a little bit of a journey uh, for forces, and hopefully our journey won't end uh, as we're talking about crash hazards. So we're going to talk about large decelerations. What does that mean? And what does that mean for our bodies? How can we calculate the types of forces involved in a crash and a collision? And what kind of thing that does to the car, the body, and how car manufacturers try to keep us fragile beings of flesh and bone to stay alive? Uh, and then we're going to calculate the forces involved in bringing us down to a nice steady stop gradually without getting squished. So the first thing I'd like you to do is try to remember from our last lesson uh, the factors that affect the stopping distance of the car. If you don't know the answer to this, uh, go back to my previous video uh, or uh, watch the whole CP2 forces uh, thing uh, using the playlist up above. Right, welcome back. Uh, the factors that affect the stopping distance of the car. Well, you've got two main factors. I don't know why I'm doing that. Two main factors. You've got thinking distance and braking distance. Now, the thinking distance is the time you are, or the distance you are traveling while you are reacting. So the time between you going, <gasps> a deer, and your foot finally stomping on the brake, uh, that takes a certain amount of time. That thinking time, your vehicle is traveling at the same speed as before the incident. So that can be quite lengthy. If the other factor is the braking distance, these are affected by your car, the surface of the road, and other factors. So our thinking distance is affected by things like um, drug taking and alcohol and caffeine these things affect our reaction times and our braking distance is affected by whether or not the road is slippery whether it's icy or wet or the uh, brakes uh, or how bold the tires are apologies for that interruption i was brought a piece of fresh carrot cake mm, yummy okay now in recent times we have sent probes to Mars. We've sent massive robots that roam around the Martian surface, surveying the land, taking samples and doing all kinds of science experiments and taking photos and things. Now, it's very difficult to land something uh, on another planet. Now, you may have seen uh, SpaceX uh, landing rockets vertically and being able to reuse rockets. Now, this is fantastic, but we just haven't had that technology available before we sent up our Mars rovers. So what they tend to do is they drop them uh, from parachutes and they uh, deploy these massive, great big airbags. And the whole Mars rover is encased in this uh, protective shell with these big giant bubble airbags on them. And they land on the floor, they crash and they bounce about a bit. The airbags deflate and then they open up and let the Mars rover out. At least that's the hope. We have lost one or two in these attempts, but mainly uh, it's working well. What I'd like you to do, please, is write a couple of sentences trying to explain how you think that works, uh, what the effect of the airbag is. Now, uh, if you have no idea, what I suggest you do is pause this video and go and have another quick video uh, look at a video uh, on YouTube just to have a quick look at how airbags work. Right, so let's move on to collisions. In a car crash, the vehicles involved come to a stop very quickly. You have two vehicles and they stop. Well, actually, not quite. They'll come at each other and then they'll kind of crash and the energy is dissipated somehow. Now this is weird for me because normally 
when I teach this, the first thing I do is I show a video of an incredibly popular TV show uh, where they do a crash test of a Volvo and a new Renault. And they fire off these two cars uh, at roughly 40 miles an hour at each other. And uh, the Volvo is uh, an old spec Volvo. It's literally a battering ram. And they fire it at this new Nissan. And the two collide, uh, driver's side to driver's side. And the whole thing is filmed in slow motion. I'm going to link that video above uh, if I find it. And I'll put it down in the description as well. It's an amazing video and it's well worth a watch. Watch that and come back here. But in a collision, excuse me, in a collision, you have a deceleration. You have a vehicle traveling at a speed and then all of a sudden it comes to rest. That's a deceleration, which is a negative acceleration. It's got to go from a speed to stopped, some, uh, some speed to zero speed. And so if it does that very quickly, that is an incredibly fast deceleration. Now, cast your mind back uh, a ways to Newton's second law. Mass is, e uh, sorry, force is equal to mass times acceleration. If you have a very rapid deceleration and you have a mass, you can work out the force required to decelerate the object. So you could work out the forces that are being applied to uh, the people inside the vehicle. Now, people, uh, fragile human beings, um, don't particularly like to be de decelerated very rapidly. Um, we tend to break uh, because what happens if the force in the, uh, involved in the collision, bringing that car to the stop, if that force is transferred to the human body, we're done for. We crack into tiny pieces. Now, this isn't very good. Um, so we need to calculate the forces involved so that manufacturers of cars can work out how to slow down that collision. If you can slow down the deceleration, then you have a lower deceleration at the same mass, and therefore you're reducing the force. So collisions and how to help us um, survive collisions is all about slowing down the crash, taking the energy out of the crash and decelerating over a longer period of time. Because what that does is it reduces the forces going into the person. One of the ways in which car manufacturers try to save lives is with crumple zones. Um, here is like a closed passage, but with pictograms to help you work out what the words are. Have a go at writing this down and replacing those pictures with the words. Right, welcome back. Well, crumple zones are areas of a vehicle that are designed to be crushed, but in a controlled way in a collision. They increase the time taken to change the momentum in a crash, which reduces the force involved. Remember, we've looked at all of these things, Newton's second law, momentum. We know that if we change the time of a crash, we reduce uh, the acceleration or deceleration, but that also reduces the momentum. And so to do that, reducing the force involved in the momentum will reduce the force going into the person. And that's what crumple zones do. They essentially absorb the energy. Now, hopefully you've gone away and you've watched the video of the Renault versus the Volvo. If you haven't, here's a very, very, very brief synopsis. And I do definitely recommend you watch it. The Volvo, which is essentially a massive steel box, uh, and the Renault, which are very, is a very new car. Um, well, I say new, it was filmed uh, quite late in the 2000s, but here we go. Uh, the Volvo uh, comes along and they both crash together. And you'd expect the Volvo to come out unscathed because it's a huge, rigid box, but it doesn't. The entire front just kind of uh, collapses in on itself. And all of the force basically gets shunted into this L shape. And so uh, 
uh, the car just disintegrates on one side. This is the driver side. Uh, and so all of that force goes into the driver uh, and that's gonna cause significant damage to the driver. Now the Renault comes along and as it crashes, it has crumple zones. So the energy actually is spread across the car. So the whole front, even though it's hit on this side, the whole front crumples in and the uh, body of the car, literally you can see the energy going through it in waves, uh, is designed to take the energy around and away from the driver. And all of this slows down the crash inside kind of like the bubble of this car. And when you open the door of the Renault, you can see that actually uh, what's happened is the crumple zones have done their job. And the person inside is going to have minor, if any, injuries. So bearing that in mind, which of these two statements is true? If two vehicles, both traveling at 60 miles an hour, collide head on, the crash is much worse than a car traveling at 60 miles an hour hitting a wall. Now, you can imagine this, a car uh, traveling 60 miles an hour and hitting a wall that isn't going to go anywhere. That's pretty bad, right? But it's only worse because there are two lots of people to be injured, two cars to be damaged, the forces on the car are just the same. Which of those do you think is true? Well, you're right. I hopefully the first one is correct. I mean, yeah, sure, there are two lots of people and two inju uh, to be injured and two cars damaged, but the forces are not the same. If you have a car coming at 60 miles an hour in this direction, a car coming at 60 miles an hour in this direction, the impact here in the middle pretty much happens at 120 miles an hour. It's the equivalent of one car stopping, like our wall, but this car traveling at 120 and hitting the wall. If both cars come and collide at 30 miles an hour, that is the same as a car hitting a wall at 60 miles an hour, pretty much. So if you're in a head-on collision, this is why head-on collisions tend to be worse, is because you are doubling the speed of the cars. Or if one car is traveling, you know, you add the, the speeds of the cars together. The resultant uh, at speed is pretty large. So we can calculate these forces involved um, by the change in momentum. So if you have a car that is traveling, you know its mass, presumably, and it has a velocity, when the collision occurs, you have a change in momentum. You're going from a velocity to zero. So here um, we have a negative acceleration because our final velocity is going to be zero. So mass times final velocity is zero. So you have minus mu divided by the time taken. So the longer that time takes, you're dividing the mass by the velocity uh, over that longer time, which means the force is lower. So again, if you can minimize the time in a collision, you are minimizing the force. But we can calculate the forces if we need to. Here's an example. The 1500 kilogram car is traveling at 15 meters per second, which is around about 30 mile an hour when it hits a wall comes to a stop in 0 0.07 seconds, what's the force acting on the car? Well, as I've said, force is the mass times the final velocity minus mass times the initial velocity divided by the time taken to collide. 1500 or 1500 multiplied by zero is zero. Minus 1500 multiplied by 15 is 22,500. Divide that by the time taken, 0.07, and that gives you a whopping great force of 321,429 newtons. And that negative sign there shows you that force is in the opposite direction to the original motion. So your car is coming in this way and the force is pushing back that way. Now remember Newton's third law. If you are traveling this way and everything stops, uh, you're going to keep traveling until something stops you. 
This is why seat belts are important. If you take your seat belt off and you collide, that force there, that 321,000 uh, newtons, is going to apply to you. Uh, it's going to apply to the car, pushing the car uh, in the opposite direction. You are going to carry on moving until something stops you. Uh, and that something is going to be the windscreen of the car if it's not already shattered, uh, or you're going to go flying straight out of the car. Uh, both of these things are incredibly bad. If there's no airbag and there's no seatbelt, uh, then this is bad because you are going to carry on forward until you hit the dashboard, crushing the lower half of your body. Your head may well hit uh, the windscreen, essentially knocking you out, if not killing you. Uh, and it will shatter the windscreen. If the windscreen is already broken, you're going to be propelled through it or essentially folded in half, uh, breaking your spine, possibly cutting yourself uh, quite dangerously uh, on the windscreen as well. It's going to be pretty horrific. Um, so seatbelts are going to save you because it's going to stop you from doing that. And again, a seatbelt, if you sit in a car and you pull on a seatbelt, it will give slightly and then it will lock. What it doesn't do is immediately lock into place. It's not a forced bar, because if that happened, then all of that force would essentially crush you. So what it does is it allows you to move slightly before holding you back. So it does have that jarring jolt, but it has allows you to kind of remove some of that force. The airbag does the thing, same thing in the opposite direction. The airbag explodes into your face, allowing your body to cushion, but it deflates immediately. So it reduces that time it takes for your body uh, to go forward. So it's reducing that force. That 321,000 newtons, if that force goes through your body as it is, you're not going to survive. But with a seatbelt slowing you down, increasing that time from 0.07 seconds to a bit longer, and that um, airbag coming out and slowing you down even more, that's going to reduce that force. And if you see slow motor motion footage of uh, crash test dummies, the car has come to a stop and the crash test dummy is still moving. So that means the length of the crash for the person has been increased. And that means the forces have been reduced and the rate of survival is going to go up. Right, your final task then is to lie. We love a good lie to me, plenary. Uh, write down three statements about crash hazards, three things you've learned today. Uh, but two of them have to be a lie and one of them true. Uh, I want to see if you can fool me. Uh, so make sure you have those uh, written down and submit your work in the normal way. Right, stay safe and I'll see you soon.